Welcome to part B. But it wasn't just the launch titles. It was a continual release of high quality games that continued the Game Boy's success. Other games, such as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, came out later. This is seriously one of my favourite games of all time, being a worthy pseudo-successor to the game Chuck Egg, but taking that concept and running with it. Every level on it is a surprise, and if you can handle the frustrating play and die and learn game mechanics, you're in for a real treat. Check out my video of the full review of the game. Then there was Bugs Bunny, another classic NES title that in my opinion was made even better by the simplistic need of the Game Boy. It was a great platformer with great playability and great music. Then there was Castlevania 2 Belmont's Revenge. Forget about the poor original release for the Game Boy and concentrate just on the sequel which is infinitely better and shows you what a Game Boy can really do. Then there was Double Dragon, a great conversion of a classic brawler that is fun to play for some simple smashing fun. Another the great game was Dr. Franken. This was a far better on the Game Boy than the ports on the other consoles. In the game you play Frankie who must explore the castle finding keys and objects to progress. What is impressive is the detailed locales and stunning graphics throughout as you explore the imaginative castle. Then there was Garfield Labyrinth. Little to do with Garfield but a fun puzzle game nonetheless. Then we had Gargoyle's Quest. Taking the bad guy from Ghouls and Ghosts gives you a compelling platform game that makes full use of its hardware. Then you had Golf, which was Mario and Golf in the palm of your hand. Next we had Gremlins 2. This is the best Gremlins game ever released in my opinion, offering gamers a great platform action, albeit with rock hard levels. It also had one of the greatest in-game musics. But then there was Legend of Zelda The Link's Awakening. The Game Boy and the Game Boy Color have so many exclusive Zelda games released that are well worthy of tracking down and playing. All are great, but the first Game Boy release always keeps a special place in my heart. Then you had Mario's P-Cross. Imagine Sudoku meets Minesweeper and you have an enjoyable puzzle game that will have you addicted. Then we had Monster Max. Ever wonder what the creators John Rittman and Bertie Drummond of Head Over Heels and Batman fame would do if they had more powerful hardware than this humble specky? Well, wonder no more and track down this great, underrated classic. Then you had Pinball Revenge of the Gator, an enjoyable pinball game. Next, you had the sequel to Super Mario Land called Super Mario 2. This really showed off what the Game Boy could do and is a great Super Mario game as well. Finally, you had WWE. WF superstars. Back in the early 90s, American wrestling was absolutely huge, and so any game that allowed gamers to play their wrestling heroes pummeling each other would be gladly played. In 1996, the Game Boy would have a resurgence of popularity thanks to a new game released for it that became the new must-have killer game. Originally called Pocket Monsters in Japan, it was shortened down to Pokemon due to similar sounding toy in America. The game was a bit like Zelda in the top-down adventure, but the twist was that instead of rescuing princesses, you were hunting for creatures that you could combine together to fight with other creatures, making your own monsters more powerful. This gave the game an addictive quality and a collectaholic's dream. As the tagline goes, you gotta collect them all. The game was the original brainchild of Satoshi Tajiri Oniwa, who had been an avid insect collector as a child and so wanted to virtually give gamers that excitement he'd felt as a kid discovering new creatures hidden away. The original game, Pokemon, under the subtitles Red and Blue, was a massive success, as in gamers invested hours of their life to find the 151 Pokemon monsters in the game. The game since has gone on to strength to strength, being a, now a massive franchise that boasts a wide range of products and merchandise, and even a successful cartoon show. Further Game Boy variants would follow with the streamlined Game Boy Pocket released in 1996. 
This was much smaller and slimmer in design and energy efficiency, only needing two AA batteries as opposed to the original four. It also had a much better screen, being a true black and white, as opposed to the original green washed out display. Then, in 1995, Gunpei would release the Virtual Boy, which would try to bring 3D gaming to gamers with their own goggles. This machine was quite frankly a disaster, offering for your $189 a blurry red game played through your goggles, whilst the 3D would quickly give you a headache. The game machine was quickly dropped by Nintendo shortly after release, and caused a lot of anger between Gunpei and Nintendo, as Gunpei felt that it was Nintendo insistence to rush to market before they released the N64 that had caused the machine being such a disaster. In 1998, the Game Boy Color would be released, which could play original Game Boy games, but also specifically written Game Boy Color games that utilised the new LED display and slightly more powerful hardware. But back to 1989, and a look at our fallen contenders. They may not have had the success of the Nintendo Game Boy, but that doesn't mean that they weren't great machines in their own right, and they all had great, unique games to play upon them. First, we'll look at the Atari Lynx that has started work back in 1986. Produced by Epix, who had been known for such classic games as California Games and the Impossible Mission Games, were working on a new portable machine called the Handy, developed by Dave Needle and RJ Mikal, both talented engineers who been instrumental in creating the Amiga. The machine was an ambitious one, offering a big 3.5 inch full colour display and impressive sound. All they needed now was a backer for the machine. The first company interested was Nintendo themselves, who asked Epix to fly out there and meet them. The meeting didn't go too well, with Epix's Joe Horowitz going for the tough American cell, which just simply didn't work on the more reserved Japanese Nintendo people. At the end of the meeting, Nintendo actually showed them what they'd been working on internally, showing them two Game Boys linked together, with the Epix team being the first non-Nintendo people to see the new device. So, with Nintendo's door slammed shut in their face, Epix continued to look for funders elsewhere. Enter Atari, who agreed to make the console, with Epix making money on just the games. However, in the true rip-off style of Jack Tramiel and his sons, Atari added a clause to this contract which meant bugs had to be fixed within 60 days of being highlighted. This gave the Atari team the ability to hold up confirmations on bugs being fixed, and so not leave enough time for Epix to fix them, and so be financially punished by Atari. It was this contract, combined with the poor success of the machine, that would end Epix going into bankruptcy and cause RJ Mikal and Dave Needle and others to leave as soon as they could. That's the end of part B, please go on to part C.